We're so glad to have you worshiping with us. We want to welcome all of you joining us online. Thanks for joining us. We're glad to have you. Uh, I would invite you to stand. We're going to worship the Lord. Psalm 126.3 says, The Lord has done great things for us, and we're filled with joy. So we're going to celebrate that tonight. Sing this with me. Come, let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet, for He has done great things. love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things oh hero of heaven you conquer the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done Father, we praise you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks for all you've done, Father. Sing this.
up with us. so grateful, Father. We, we want to worship you tonight from hearts that are full of gratitude. May the, the sweet smelling sacrifice of praise that comes from this place during this time of worship be full of gratitude.
that are full of gratitude, Father, and all God's people said, amen, amen, you can be seated. Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, David writes, you have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You've taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Our hearts in this moment, as we head into a time of communion, should echo this prayer from David. We praise God and we give thanks for who he is and for what he's done for us. And one of the central characteristics of the early church was that they broke bread and they ate together. That's what they did. In fact, Jesus on one occasion, as he was doing such a thing, sat with his disciples and he grabbed the bread and the cup and he said to do this in remembrance of me. And that's exactly what communion is. Communion is a celebration of remembrance about what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross. Because we all know there's nothing that we can do, there's nothing we can say, there's nothing that we can accomplish that makes us right with God is only through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that we have that opportunity. And so as we head into this time, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We celebrate, we praise him in this moment because of what he's done for us. I wanna encourage you to make this an act of worship, an act of praise. Lift up your hands. Give a hallelujah for what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so very grateful for what you've done for us. We're reminded of that at the very least every week when we come into this place, we kind of pause from everything else and we remember what you've done for us. Above everything else, Lord, that you have showed your love through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And we're so thankful that together as a church, as a body, we can come in unison and to take the bread and the cup that represent your body and your blood and to take them together remembering the ultimate sacrifice that was made in our place. Thank you for loving us. Help us in this moment to praise you 
from our hearts, joyfully, willingly, because of what you've accomplished for us. Jesus, we love you so much. And we thank you. We praise you in this moment. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, my name is Andrew Philbeck. I am the group's pastor here. I'm excited that I get to be here with you today, both because I get the opportunity to continue our series uh, in the book of Numbers and also because uh, if you have any questions about groups or anything that you want to learn more about groups, um, I'm going to be out just beyond those middle doors right there. Me and my assistant will be there after the service today, and we'd love to talk to you and help you any way that we can in regards to groups. Um, but as I said, we are continuing our journey through the book of Numbers in this series, A View from the Top. And today, what we're looking at is what I believe, at least, is the most familiar, the most uh, famous story from this book. And the reason I say that is because as someone who grew up in church, as someone who grew up going to Sunday school, this is the only story from the book of Numbers that I ever remember learning a song about. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that as well. If you were here with us a couple of weeks ago, uh, when we began this series, you heard my dad sing a portion of that song, in fact. And uh, if you want to hear it again, uh, you can go back and listen to that sermon again, because I'm not going to sing anything for you today. Uh, I hope no one was expecting that, or even if you just wondered that in the back of your mind, I'm sorry to uh, just throw water on that right away. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to Numbers 13. Verse 25, Numbers 13, verse 25. You can uh, hold your place there for now. This is where we're going to begin our text in just a moment. Uh, so far in our journey in this series, what we've done, honestly, is look at uh, only good things that has happened, that have happened for uh, the people of God. And we began by talking about the fact that God was literally and symbolically setting up shop in the hearts of the people, uh, and specifically by the way they were instructed to uh, lay out their camp. Uh, we talked about how he created the priesthood as a way for the people to worship him, and worship him in spite of his perfect holiness uh, and their sinfulness. He created the priesthood as uh, a go-between, a mediator. Last week, we talked about the literal presence of God over the tabernacle and how sometimes that presence would stay put and sometimes that presence would move. And so the people would either stay put or move depending on what he did. And we talked about how this was them living at the pace of God. But between what we read about and studied last week and what we're going to read about and, and study today, all that in-between space... If you were to go back and read that, uh, you would realize that some cracks have begun to form for the people of Israel, even cracks in Moses' own family. And even though they are glaring in a lot of ways, it really isn't until we get to our text today that I think we see the full extent of just what is happening to God's chosen people. Uh, so here's what we're going to do is I'm going to read a portion of our story. Uh, our text today is not the full story. It's just a portion of it, but it's going to be more than enough for you to understand what's going on. And it's going to be more than enough for us to be able to dig in and see how this still applies to our lives in different ways. Uh, the main thing that you need to know today before we read our text is that the people of Israel have reached the promised land. They have reached the land of Canaan. 
But before they enter it, God tells Moses to choose one man from each of the 12 tribes, and he tells them to go into the land and spy it out ahead of time. So Moses picks leaders from each of the 12 tribes, gives them some instructions, and sends them into Canaan. So as we do each week, if you're able, I would ask for you to please stand with me for the reading of God's word. I'm going to read Numbers 13, verse 25, all the way down to Numbers 14, verse 4. You can follow along as I read aloud. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. They reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Chapter 14. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Thank you. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. This is one of those stories where whether you have heard it several times in your life or whether this is the first time you've ever heard it, it has the power to bring us up short simply because it confounds us. We read it and it doesn't make sense. Why? Why would the people of Israel who were just let out of Egypt by God, who just ordered their camp with the presence of God, at the center, and and followed that presence of God wherever he led them, suddenly get to the finish line, suddenly get to the promised land, this land described as flowing with milk and honey, only to decide after all of that, they don't want to go in. They don't want to go in. It does not make sense to us when we read it. But here's the danger that we have to be aware of when it comes to dealing with a story like this. And the danger is that if it doesn't make sense to us, then we think that it doesn't apply to us. And the reason that is is because we read this and we think to ourselves, I would never do that. I would never travel all the way from Egypt to Canaan. I would never follow God across the floor of the Red Sea being led by a pillar of cloud and fire only to reach my destination and then not go in. Well, here's the deal. I'm not going to stand up here today and say, I'm not going to stand up here today and say that you're wrong or anything like that. But I would say we need to make sure that we're not overly confident about what we would have done had we been there. And there are a lot of things that I want to talk about today, but there are three things, three uh, reasons I believe that the Israelites failed in their goal. Three reasons that they quit just before crossing the finish line, if you will. And uh, I think they're important for us to look at, to consider, to talk about, uh, so that we can uh, really understand what's going on in our text, but also so that we can understand just how we uh, need to be able to apply this to our own lives. And I do think it's important for us to be able to apply this to ourselves, no matter who we are or how we feel about this story. But here's the deal. This is not really what I want to focus on in our time together today. So I'm going to talk about these three uh, reasons, but I'm going to do it pretty quickly before we move on. Uh, 
So the first reason I think that the Israelites behaved the way that they did was they forgot where they were. Number one is they forgot where they were. Now, here's what I mean. I don't mean that they forgot that they were on the doorstep to the promised land. I don't mean that they forgot that they were uh, just right next to the land of Canaan. What I mean is that they forgot that they were in the middle of God's plan. They forgot that they were in the middle of God's plan for their lives. Remember, the Israelites had been living in slavery to Egypt for years. But all the way back in Exodus chapter 3, we read verses like this. Exodus three seventeen, God says, And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is God's plan for their lives. This is what God wants for his followers. And yet, when we read our text and when we remember what we looked at just a moment ago, we see how the Israelites really felt about this land. And they have lots to say about it, but I'm just going to pick out one verse, Numbers 13, 32, where we read this. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. And what are they saying? What they're saying is that this land will devour us. This land will devour us. And so what God called good, both his plan for his people and this land that he wanted to give them, his people looked at it and they said, it's overwhelming. They said, we can't do this. It's going to destroy us. The second thing that they did was they forgot how they got there. They forgot how they got there. One of the most incredible things I think you see uh, when you read about the history of Israel in the Old Testament and, and specifically this, this time in the wilderness. And when we talk about the wilderness, we're talking about everything that happens between when they leave Egypt and uh, before they enter the promised land. It's everything that happens in the middle there. But one of the most incredible things that we read about is all the different ways that God provided for his people at that time. In fact, this goes all the way back to the way that they left Egypt. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the, the supernatural events, the plagues and all of those things, if you're familiar with that story, uh, that happened when they left Egypt. I'm talking about the fact that on their way out, I mean, the Egyptians were giving them treasures. They were, they were giving away the valuable things because it's like they just wanted them to leave. God had, had made them, uh, I can't remember exactly how it's rendered, but basically they, were, they favored the Israelites. Even though all this had happened, the Egyptians were like, hey, we want to do this for you on your way out. Now, this journey from Egypt to Canaan, it wasn't a journey that they had to kind of map out on their own. They didn't have to, to figure out how they were going to feed everybody and, and where they were going to get water for everybody. God provided everything that they needed for this trip. And what this essentially means, as crazy as it sounds, is that they forgot that God was with them, caring for them the whole way. They, they looked at the land of Canaan and they, they, all they did was think about the fact that it was up to them. And when it was up to them, it was too much. They forgot how they got there. Number three, they forgot who God was. They forgot who God was. The Israelites were standing before the promised land and they hear these words from the spies. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. There's more that the spies say, but that's what sticks out to me because basically what they're saying is, this is too big for us. They're looking out at everything God has in store for them and they say, this is too big for us. They're too powerful for us to contend with. They're too entrenched for us to remove. It's too big. It's all too much for us to handle. And all of these excuses, they, they metastasize in the hearts of the people because even though they have the presence of God over the tabernacle and even though they've been living at the pace of God like we talked about last week, he still wasn't real to them. And, and here's the deal. I know that that sounds like a really strange way for me to describe this to you today. But I don't know any other way to do it. They forgot the power of God. They forgot the strength of God. They forgot the scope of God. 
And so when they hear the report of the spies and they look at the power and the strength and the scope of the people living in Canaan, they withered. They withered. Now, I believe there's a root cause, a root cause for these three things. And this is why we need to pay attention to this story, because as unbelievable as it might sound to us today for the Israelites to journey to the edge of the promised land only to refuse to go in, we would be kidding ourselves if all we did was read this story and walk away with a sense of self-assurance that we would never behave that way. I would never do that. You would never do that. This is ridiculous. We have to realize there's more going on here. I say that because the root cause for all of these things, the root cause for the Israelites' behavior is fear. Fear is at the heart of all that we see here. And fear is really what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today. So before I do anything else, before we do anything else, I just want to ask you this question. Has fear ever been a problem in your life? Has fear ever, ever been a problem for you in your life? Has fear ever kept you from doing something that you wanted to do? Has fear ever kept you from doing something you know that you should do? But you were so afraid of the outcome, so afraid of your ability to to pull it off, you know, whatever you want to say, however you want to phrase it, that it stops you in your tracks. Maybe even, maybe even drove you backwards a little bit. When I was growing up in church, our youth group took a day trip to a ropes course one summer. I'm sure that uh, everyone here has done something like this or at least is familiar with it. Uh, we, got in our, we got in our 15 passenger van and we drove out somewhere in Oklahoma, I don't remember where, and we did a ropes course. We climbed up telephone poles and jumped off of them. We did rock walls. We, we walked across wires and, and, you know, did all sorts of fun stuff. But before we did all of the, the big stuff, the high stuff, we went through a low ropes course. And, you know, if you're familiar with that, then it, it's, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's, it's kind of the same idea where you're, you're balancing, you're working on stuff, you're, you're working on teamwork and You know, it's all designed uh, to prepare you for everything big that you're going to do later. And the very first thing that I remember we did as part of our low ropes course was a trust fall. Now, I know that you know what this is. And and this is, when I think about what a trust fall is, I still think about this experience because we got partners and then you had to basically fall backwards and just trust that they would catch you. And so for us, for kids, you know, I remember they, they would tell us to stand, you know, with our back to our partner Uh, And, you know, stretch your arms out like this. We were supposed to close our eyes. And your partner was supposed to stand behind you and kind of make a hook shape, more or less, with their hands or with their arms. And so with your arms outstretched and their arms like this, it was easy for them, easier for them to catch you. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on here with the people of Israel. It's a trust fall. God is saying to them, fall. Fall. Fall and I will catch you. And the people, they look at where God is asking them to fall and they look back at God and they say, no, no. They didn't trust that God would catch them. They didn't trust God to take care of them. And here's the deal. Even though they should have, even though they should have done those things, there is a a part of me that doesn't want to be overly critical of them, not because they didn't do something wrong. They did. Absolutely, they did something wrong. But because this fear, this mistrust of God, it's always been there. And it's still a part of so many people's lives today. I mean, this is what we see all the way back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, where they didn't trust God. They felt like God was holding out on them. You know, they, 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 they're tempted by this serpent. They hear about this, this tree that's going to let them experience new things, things they've never experienced before. It's going to let them learn things that they're missing out on. And they think, well, maybe God is holding out on us. Maybe, you know, it, it's good here, but maybe, maybe there's more to life than just this. They didn't trust God. And so they took matters into their own hands. And listen, we'd be kidding ourselves if if we didn't think this was something that people still wrestled with today. 
You know, for people outside of the church, if you've ever talked to someone who's not a Christian, talked to someone about becoming a Christian, there's a mistrust of God there. You know, they, they look at becoming a Christian and they think about what it might mean. And, and, you know, they think, well, if I become a Christian, I'm not going to be able to have fun anymore. If I become a Christian, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have the friends that I have. I'm, I'm going to lose my identity. I'm not going to be able to live life the way that I've been living. I'm going to lose everything. They don't trust God to catch them when they fall. But what about those of us who call ourselves Christians? What about those of us who are Christians? Do we always and completely trust God? Do we always cling to him and, and never second guess anything that we, we're, he, that we hear, that we read, that we're convicted by out of a sense of fear? I can't answer that question for you today, and I'm not going to try, but I will say this. When I answer that question for myself, the answer is not always what I want it to be. I think for many people in church today, we want enough of God to save us, but not enough to change us. Because when God talks about changing us and when we think about, you know, what it means, really deep down the implications for that, for what it means for, for things like our, our priorities, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we address the idols in our lives, the things that we value too much, how, how we, we treat the people, not just the people around us, but the people that uh, aren't like us, the people that honestly we don't really like. It pushes us to the limits of our comfort zone. And listen, we all have comfort zones. We all have areas in our lives where we feel safe and secure, people groups, uh, activities, uh, you know, whatever it is. And when we look into the depths of this new and better life that God wants for us, what we're doing in one sense is standing on the edge of the promised land. And we have to decide if we're going to trust God. We have to decide if we're going to trust God with, with all that we are, every aspect of our lives, and so much of the time, too much of the time, we stay in our comfort zone. We say no. If you were with us last week, you know that we talked about the people of Israel living at the pace of God. Because, you know, they stayed when the presence of God stayed over the tabernacle. And they moved when the presence of God moved away from the tabernacle. But, you know, what, what I think about when we read our, our story today is that, you know, as, as great as that sounds, what it makes me think is that they were only doing that as long as there wasn't anything on the line. They were willing to live at the pace of God as long as it was safe. I, you know, I was thinking about this. It reminds me of a great, a great part of... Um, from the book, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. If, if you've never read that, you should read it. Uh, if you've never read it, what I'm about to tell you is going to sound really strange, uh, and that's fine. Uh, but C.S. Lewis writes this book, and, and in it, you have the, these children who enter this, you know, land called Narnia, and it's all an allegory. Uh, and uh, the character Susan, the oldest uh, sister, she's talking to uh, Mr. Beaver. I told you it was going to sound strange if you've never read it. But she's talking to Mr. Beaver, and she's, she's scared because she realizes that they've been talking about this person named Aslan, who is the Christ character. He's, he's the Jesus character in this story. Like I said, it's an allegory. And she's scared because she thought that they were talking about a man, but she finds out that they'd been talking about a lion. Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought... He was a man, and this is, this is why it sticks out to me, because she asks this question, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. So many people, too many people who call themselves Christians today, they're like, they're like Susan in this story, and they, and they, they believe in God, and, and, they, and they trust God, but what they want in their hearts is a safe God, a God that's not going to scare them, a God that has all the same opinions that they do, a God that likes and dislikes all the same people that they do. You know, they want a God who's never going to ask them to go outside of their comfort zone. And so when he inevitably does, they freeze. They don't know what to do. Just a few days ago, I was reading in a devotional that I have 
Uh, and I just read something that really it, it stuck out to me in light of what I wanted to talk about today. And I know that I just uh, read a quote from one book. I'm going to read another quote from a book, so I apologize for that. But it really gets at the heart of what I think a lot of people struggle with. This is from a man named Paul David Tripp. He says, so many of us have a huge dark hole in the middle of our gospel. Sure, we have a pretty good understanding of the gospel past the forgiveness that we have received through the sacrifice of Jesus, and a fairly clear understanding of salvation future, the eternity that we will spend with Jesus. But have we really understood well the benefits of the work of Christ in the here and now? The Bible powerfully declares that Jesus didn't just die for your past or your future, but for all the things that you face right here, right now. The Israelites, they were afraid that if they stepped in the promised land, they were afraid that God would let them down. They let fear be the driving force for the decisions that they made. And specifically, it was this fear of failure. You know, as we've already said, you know, they, they looked out at the land, they listened to the spies, they, they saw the people, the cities, and they said, We can't do this, we can't win. So, what did they do? What did they decide? Well, they decided to go back to Egypt. That's the way that our, our, our text that we read today ended. It said, if only we had died in Egypt or in the desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. And this is the last thing we really need to process in our text today before we get to the application. Because like so much of the story, we read these verses and we think, how can they do this? What on earth is going through their minds? But I believe that what we see in this section, in these verses, it shows us just, just how strong a foothold fear had in the hearts of these people. Because what they're doing in one sense, honestly, is they're saying, I would rather choose what I know, no matter how bad it is, than what I don't know. You know I, I can hear him. I can hear him in my head saying, you know, I understand it's Egypt. I understand that it wasn't the greatest situation, but if we go back, it's going to be different now. It'll be different now. I mean, think about how we left there's no way that if we went back, after everything that happened, they would treat us the same way. They learned their lesson. And on top of that, you know, it's familiar. It's comfortable. We've been there for generations. There was too much uncertainty in Canaan, too many unknowns. It required too much trust. And it's important for us to look at it this way because when we do, it causes us to realize that so many people still live their lives by this type of reasoning. We choose what is safe. We stick with what we know. And what do we see here? We see the reality that God has a new and better life for his people. He has a plan to take care of them. He has the ability to provide for them. And he has the power to make it all happen. And what they have to do is trust him. And you and me today, even though we can read this story and we can think, how can they choose Egypt over Canaan? How can they choose slavery over freedom? We have to acknowledge all the times in our own lives when we choose sin over our own salvation. All the times that we fall back into old habits. And when we do, what we're doing is the same thing that the Israelites did. We're choosing to go back to Egypt in our own lives, in our own way. Even though God has called us to a new and better life. And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 8. He says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave to sin. We didn't read the next part of our story. I told you I was only reading a portion of it uh, for you today. Uh, but what happens is because the people decide that it is too much for them because the people decide they are going to go back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron, they have to intercede on the people's behalf. This is because God obviously knows what's going on and he's had enough. He, he says he's done with these people. He says he's going he's gonna to destroy them all and start over. But Moses and Aaron, they pray, 
they intercede, and this is what we see in Numbers 14, 20 through 23. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. And this is the point, this is the moment when the book of Numbers becomes the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. One year for every day the spies spent in the land of Canaan. And in that time, everyone who's 20 years old and up, except for Joshua and Caleb, the two good spies, the two spies who wanted to enter the land, who trusted God, everyone else will die as they wander. You know, so much of the book of Numbers is, is tied, is, is rooted in the events that take place in the book of Exodus where God sets his people free from slavery in Egypt. And there's a verse toward the very beginning of this book that really highlights what you and I need to do and what the Israelites should have done in order to not let our lives be controlled by fear. In Exodus 2, verse 24, it might sound a little strange. We read these words. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And the key for us today are those two words, he remembered. God remembered. God remembered his people and his promise that he had made. And when you read through the Old Testament, you see statements like this over and over again where God remembers his people, where God remembers a person. And here's the deal. Without going too deep into things today, what this means is not that God had forgotten something or that God had forgotten someone. What it means is that God is about to do something. Whenever you read that God remembered, it means that God is about to act. And here's the deal. The thing that will allow us to take action in our lives when we're afraid is our ability to remember God. Our ability to remember God. Our ability to remember God. Who God is and what God has done is what gives us the courage that we need to take action in times of fear in our own lives. In the book of Numbers, we see that the people forgot. They forgot that God had just brought, they forgot that God had just brought a global superpower to its knees when it comes to the land of Egypt. And because of that, they were too afraid to enter Canaan. I mean, listen, I don't know the specifics, but when I, when I read this, I think, you know, what, what, was, what was Canaan compared to Egypt? And you saw all that God had done there, and yet you're, you're too afraid? You're too afraid to deal with the people who live in Canaan after you saw how God dealt with the people who lived in Egypt? But they forgot. And if they had only remembered, if they'd only remembered what God had done, truly remembered it, in, in a, a life-changing, action-oriented way, then everything would have been different. And you and I, we need to do the same thing in our lives. What we need to do is we need to remember God the way that God remembers us. We need to remember God the way that God remembers us. We need to remember that through Jesus, God didn't just bring a nation to its knees. He brought death to its knees. And that's the gospel message. And it's even more miraculous than anything we read about in the book of Exodus. And we need to remember that. But just like the people of Israel who stood on the doorstep of the promised land, we need to do more than just remember it in our heads. It needs to be real in our hearts. And that means we need to keep on remembering the gospel message of Jesus. Keep on remembering that we're saved by God's grace, not by our own abilities. We need to keep remembering that God is bigger than every situation we will face and he is with us in the face of every situation we ever encounter. And if those truths are at the center of our lives, they give us the courage that we need to act. 
And when we keep on remembering that, even if there are times and moments and situations where we do feel fear and we do feel uncertainty, we'll still be able to move because the God who lives in us will outweigh all the fear and uncertainty around us. There's a great, there's a great verse in Romans, Romans 8.32, that just captures the heart of this. This is the way it's rendered in the New Living Translation. Paul says, since we did not, sorry, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? What does that mean? What did we just read? I mean, Paul is basically telling us, you know, why would God, why would God go through the whole ordeal of sending his son, sending his son to live a perfect life, to, to satisfy the law of God to die on a cross so that we can be righteous in the eyes of God only to then deny us, only to then let us fall. It doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense for God to go through all of that. But at the same time, we read our story and this is what the Israelites believed. They believed that God had gone through all of the trouble of rescuing them from Egypt, the plagues leading them across the Red Sea, leading them by cloud and fire, providing for them as they traveled, only to set them up for failure in Canaan. And here's the deal. One of the things that this story in Numbers reveals to us is not how foolish the Israelites were, but it reveals to us how easily this can happen to someone how easily this can happen to someone. Christians today, we may not have been set free from the physical, the physical bonds of slavery like the Israelites were, but we've been set free from spiritual slavery. And just like the Israelites, we have to choose between trusting God and moving forward in our lives or giving in to fear and going back to Egypt, going back to the bondage of sin. You know what our story is today? It's a cautionary tale. Because you can look at it one of two ways. You can look at it and you can say, well, that would never happen to me. That would never happen to me. Or you can look at it and you can say, I need to always remember the glory and the power and the grace of God so that that never happens to me. There's a familiar passage for many of you in Matthew 6. And this is how we'll close. The, the band can come back out and get ready to play our final song. Jesus is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what he says. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you'll have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothes, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for all that you've done for us and help us, Lord, to remember your plan, your provision, and your power. Help us to trust you, to be honest about the things that we fear and the times that we've given into fear. Help us to see the reality of our lives so that we can grow. Let us not be cowards but fill us with the faith that we need to move forward, even if it's just one small step at a time. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
invite you to stand and we'll sing one more song together. Father, we thank you, Jesus.